Hello, Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense. Thank you for watching. Today's video is going to be on force on force training. In my opinion, uh, force on force training is the ultimate firearms related self defense training that anyone can take. Force on force is a form of reality based training. Reality based training um, uses role players and realistic scripts or scenarios and or props to create a very uh, dynamic training environment that for the student it makes it as realistic as is possible or close to as realistic you know as you can get what that does uh, as far as reality based training what it does for the student is it allows them to undergo a little bit of stress inoculation and it builds upon that person's quote unquote mental uh, Rolodex. It gives them uh, some type of experience to draw upon in future type of scenarios. Force on force is used extensively by police and military within the police uh, arena. Police use these type of uh, equipment in active shooter training. They do, um, you know, their traffic stops, you know, just simple stuff. They'll use the force on force equipment for that. Um, SWAT teams will use it. Uh, they'll use the rifles and the pistols and stuff, you know, inside buildings doing, you know, close quarter combat kind of stuff. Um, military uses it for that same, same reason using, um, the equipment in a urban environment so they'll have the force on force rifles firing the marking rounds you know within you know little mock-up cities or they'll have buildings and stuff they'll go through and use it all branches of the military use it um, when it comes to law enforcement not every agency has has these things your larger agencies with larger bud budgets typically have these um, you're very small, small, small agencies and within small counties, you know, they, they probably don't uh, have a whole lot of this stuff. If they do, you know, they, they may have a few and, and they just don't really have the budget to do a whole lot with it. Your state level academies and stuff, they're going to have these things in most places uh, for new officers and training to go through. And it's, it's, it's been around since uh, the 1980s, at least. Uh, the marking cartridges and everything have been uh, there's been a lot of change uh, of course over the years you know back when it all first started basically people were taking uh, 38 caliber casings and um, putting wax in them and shooting shooting them out of revolvers and of course that evolved and today now uh, Glock you know they manufacture a special a uh, training pistol that fires the special non-lethal uh, non training ammunition and the company uh, simunition they make conversion slides to go on multitude of different guns and there's even another company called UTM that makes their own proprietary ammo and conversion slides so it's used quite a bit uh, within the training industry however it is mostly within the military and law enforcement community where you see these things. There's very few uh, commercial farms training companies that, that have these and that's because they're pretty hard to get a hold of because Glock, uh, and especially for these, Glock doesn't really sell them to anyone outside of military law enforcement so they somewhat take on that unattainium kind of status. But it's a very highly sought after level of training because it is, like I said, some of the best training that you can get. Since this stuff has come about, like I said, over the years, lots of improvements have been made and these are very safe and effective training tools. Uh, they're better than using just inert guns. Inert guns being something like this. 
Now, I'm not saying that uh, you know these should totally replace inert guns. These still have their place depending on what kind of training you're doing because sometimes the training you're doing doesn't really require always shooting at someone. So these still have their place in the world and I highly recommend anyone who's serious about training having this in their own uh, personal collection so that they have it for practice. With the force on force tools you are able to have an actual 3d training environment when you think about firearms training shooting at the range you're kind of limited in the directions and the areas in which you can shoot so typically with live ammo you have only a certain area that you can fire live ammo into um, you know if you're in an indoor range Typically, it's just one direction that you can fire in, and you cannot fire in any other direction up, back, behind you, completely off to the sides or down due to ricochet and or the backdrops just not being sufficient enough to stop the ammo. Same with outside ranges. You're limited to pretty much what's directly in front of you, and even then, you can't elevate the gun too high or else the rounds will go over the backdrop and then travel for miles and potentially kill someone or injure someone you know a couple miles away <clears throat> so with these you can have a true 3d training environment uh, even for shoot houses uh, you're still limited with uh, the directions that you can shoot so and then the shoot houses themselves are pretty limited uh, in numbers of, of how many there are and who they let into them. So most shoot houses are uh, military law enforcement only. There are some across the country that do allow regular people in them. And you can uh, shoot um, in many directions. However, it is not a true 3D environment because you can't shoot upwards because typically in a shoot house, uh, the catwalks are above and that's typically where the instructors and evaluators stand at and uh, I don't think they're going to be taking too kindly to you shooting upwards at them with live ammo. So you get a true 3D training environment um, and you can take this to more places. You're not contained to just a shooting range and you're not contained to just a shoot house. You can take this equipment and you can use it in any building. You can, for example, churches or schools or companies that want to have active shooter training. You can take this equipment on site and it is essentially a plug and play kind of setup for churches and schools and businesses that are interested in active shooter type of training. What better way to train to respond to an active killer event than to do it in the place where you're wanting that training to be useful for. Um, you know, church security teams can train in their own church so that they can get the most maximized amount of realistic training possible. They don't have to pretend that they are sitting off on a church pew within within their church and um, and basically you know revert to imaginary play like a child they can do it in the place where they are expected to be at same with schools uh, obviously police will use this in, in most public schools um, during the summers typically when schools out of session uh, or on weekends and it allows police to train for active shooter events within the very schools that they would be responding to. And when law enforcement involves the teachers um, and other school staff, the school staff get to obviously train in the same place they're going to be working at. Same for companies, you know, uh, large corporations or, you know, factories, places like that where they have uh, hostile terminations, you know, disgruntled workers who want to come back and shoot up the workplace those people can train in the very same environment that they're going to be working in. So it is a, a great tool to be able to take almost anywhere. The limitations would be 
obviously like a public sidewalk or something like that uh, where there's a lot of traffic going on uh, you would you would virtually have to shut down um, that sidewalk or that road to any pedestrian or vehicle traffic because you know people walking through there would need safety equipment so you know other than environments like that this equipment can you be used just almost anywhere you can even use it inside of a car <clears throat> The ammunition uh, for Force on Force uh, is it is pretty safe to use. Um, these guns will will not fire live ammo. They're in, they're incapable of uh, having projectiles, live projectiles, come out of the barrel. So it reduces significantly any risks that are involved. Now there's still some risk involved depending on what you're using. The revolvers are still a risk and the shotguns are still a risk. The rifles, uh, the bolts that are designed, uh, they're designed in such a way that they're not capable of firing a live round. So you can drop a bolt into an AR-15 rifle, a force on force bolt into a AR-15 rifle and um, if a live round was somehow accidentally chambered into it, it's not going to go off. So the ammo is, is pretty safe. Um, the ammo does produce a pain uh, stimulus. It's not, in my opinion, as painful as a paintball round. Uh, if you've ever played paintball, you know how much that hurts. Uh, these are not as painful as that, but they do uh, produce a, uh, a pain stimulus. And pain is a good teacher. Typically, uh, when something happens to you that is painful, you do things differently so that you do not experience that pain again. Your, your clothing is not going to be permanently damaged from the marking rounds. The marking rounds are biodegradable, toxic-free uh, paint. It washes off very easily in the washer. Um, realistically, the biggest risk to your clothing would be uh, not from the marking rounds, but from rolling it around on the ground and getting grass stains or um, you know ripping your pants or something like that. That's going to be the biggest risk to your clothing. Um, the marking rounds, you know, they wash up and wash off walls uh, pretty easily as well. So you know, if you use it in the schools or churches or businesses or whatever, you know, a couple walls get hit and there's paint on them, it washes right off. It doesn't stain or leave permanent. Uh, marks on there. The guns are a high-vis blue. It makes them very distinguishable as a training weapon. Uh, even the um, conversion slides that you can get to put on a live frame, they're blue, so that makes them pretty well distinguishable. Um, the bolts that go into the rifles, they're blue, and then you can get the blue barrels on rifles. Um, magazines you know the the floor plates are blue you can get some all blue rifle mags um, you can even take uh, painters tape and and wrap it around certain pieces of equipment to denote it as training only so in those regards uh, this equipment is pretty pretty easily distinguishable vis visually uh, and letting you know that it is for training only and that does make the training environment a little bit safer The equipment is a one-to-one -one scale, so this force on force gun is built at the factory in Georgia uh, for Glock. And when Glock, uh, you know, they make a batch of these, they're using the same people and the same equipment that make the real guns. They just change um, a couple things as far as the, the process to making the slide and everything else. But other than that, it's virtually all the same as the real live guns. So what that means is, for example, with this one, this one has a streamlight attached to it, so it, you can use your existing equipment with it. You know, if you have a streamlight, Surefire, or even if you have the DevGrew uh, switch or uh, remote switch, whatever you want to call it, attached on there to the light, it's going to fit on the gun. If you have the Crimson Trace uh, laser attachments on there, that's going to work. You can change the sights out. You can put your own sights on there. 
Um, one of these I'm going to be putting excess big dot sites on there, but you can put whatever site you want to on there. Um, and in, even conceivably change out the uh, the trigger. You could put another trigger in there. Um, you know, let's say for example, you know, you wanted the the New York trigger on there uh, because that's what you you know you carry. You could do that if you wanted to put an extended uh, mag release on there because that's what you have on your gun. Obviously, you can put one in there and it works. You know, if you want a more aggressive um, uh, slide stop release right there, you can change that out, no problem. These are one to one. All your attachments work with it, and all your support gear obviously works with it. So, you carry a Glock 17, then your Glock 17 holster, made for your light is going to work. So you get to use all your same equipment. You don't have to switch anything out. Uh, you just take your live gun out, take your live ammo and magazines out of your pouches and you just replace it with the force on force gun and your magazines that are clearly marked for training and loaded with the marking cartridges. The, the guns being virtually the same as a real gun and the way the ammunition is designed, it gives you a, a very realistic um, action. So when you fire this thing, the slide is gonna, it's gonna fly back, it's going to uh, throw out empty casing and you'll, you know, you can hear those things thinking across the ground, making that, you know, that the classic, you know, cliche sound of, you know, brass uh, skittering across the ground or whatever. Um, you'll hear a loud pop. Of course, it's not going to be as loud as an actual gun going off, but you'll hear a loud pop. Um, under certain lighting conditions, you can even see uh, sparks flying out from where the primer is um, um, being fired off in this gun. And you get a little bit of smoke that comes out of it as well. Not a whole lot, but a little bit. So it gives it a very realistic uh, feel to it. Certainly a lot better than, say for example, an airsoft gun where, you know, even if you have had a gas powered airsoft gun, um, it's still a lot more realistic than using that. The force on force training and reality based training can bring about uh, to the student some of the same psychological and physiological physi physiological changes um, that a person could experience when in a real gunfight because you are replicating um, that type of scenario as close as you can without actually getting into it and you see a lot of the things happen so you know in a real gunfight someone could experience um, increased heart rate, increased breathing, have a huge adrenaline dump, you know, tunnel vision, auditory exclusion, etc. Those same things can happen to a person when they are doing force on force training. And when that happens, you can get um, a person to be somewhat stress inoculated. So if you take a person and they've gone through a force on force class that had something like between you know 10 to 15 scenarios in there where they had to fight somebody else uh, they are going to be way ahead of the curve than someone who has not done any of that type of reality based training if you take someone who all they've ever done is shoot at paper targets on a range and you compare them to you know someone who's done force on force training and has has gone through those feelings and those experiences the person who's done force on force is going to perform under stress a lot better than the person who hasn't done anything like that before so repeated exposures to stressful situations in the force on force classes you know doing multiple scenarios can lead to stress inoculation and allow a person to perform better under stress. Uh, you know, when the, when the fight or flight uh, stimulus response kicks in, uh, your prefrontal uh, cortex, part of the brain, uh, it's 
computing power, so to speak, kind of diminishes a little bit and the midbrain kind of starts to take over a little bit more. Uh, as you do force on force and you do a lot of scenarios, you get your brain better acquainted to that stress and you're able to do better problem solving under stress because you're using the front part of your brain more than the midbrain. Uh, you're able to adapt and overcome those stressful situations a lot better than the person who hasn't experienced those things. Um, firefighters and EMS, rescue personnel, they also use reality-based training. Um, you know, for example, EMS and, and firefighters can do uh, mass casualty training exercises where they have like hundreds um, of, of volunteers, you know, or, you know, at least like maybe 20 or 30 volunteers who role play victims and they can have uh, fake blood squirted on them and they can have these basically these movie prop kind of prosthetics put on them. So, you know, there could be like a fake uh, laceration on the arm and it looks kind of realistic and have the fake blood dripping all over them. They could have, uh, you know, the what looks like uh, burned skin. It's just a prosthetic ba uh, thing you can put over someone's arm or leg and it looks like they're bleeding or, or, or looks like they're um, burned. Um, multitude of, of different things like that uh, can be done for those folks in that industry to make that training as realistic as possible. That way if some large uh, mass casualty event occurred well, those EMS and fire guys, they've already kind of experienced some of that stress involved and they can cope with it a lot better and perform a lot better and at the end result is more people get saved and you just have better service. Uh, firefighters, you know, they do the same uh, with um, some of their other training. Uh, as far as reality-based training goes, you know, they'll put on all their gear and one of the things that firefighters are trained to do uh, when they're in a house is if there's trouble, uh, they follow the fire hose back out because that fire hose obviously originates from the fire truck. And when the fire hose is inside the house and the house is full of smoke and they can't see their hand in front of their face, if they got a hold of the fire hose and they can feel the coupling, they know what direction that hose goes to just based on the coupling. And so uh, in fire departments, you know, they do a lot of reality-based training where they put on all their gear, they get a fire hose, they lay it out there in the fire bay, and they'll either turn all the lights off in the fire bay or they'll put, you know, like a, uh, a mask or, or something like that uh, over their eyes um, on top of them wearing their normal SCBA mask or they'll put tape over it or something like that, somewhere they can't see. And uh, they'll have the, the hose going up under the fire truck, they'll have it uh, going partially into a closet and coming right back out of the closet, they'll have it going over obstacles, whatever, you know, they'll just lay it in, in, in uh, funny directions and they'll have that firefighter uh, on a timer and be like, oh, you gotta, you gotta get out within so many minutes and the firefighter will, under stress, you know, find the line, follow it out and, and get to safety. Um, you know, firefighters, they also do, you know, the flashover chamber where they sit in this big box and they set stuff on fire inside of it and they get to see flames uh, going over their head. So reality-based training is a very, very useful tool because it gets the person as close to a real dangerous, stressful situation as possible without actually putting them in a whole lot of danger. And when it comes to force on force, it is the closest thing you can get to a gunfight without being in a gunfight. You know, uh, another good, uh, I guess another good analogy that I uh, could use to expound on this would be uh, pepper spray training. So, um, if we did pepper spray training like we did firearms training on the range, then that would mean that you would take your pepper spray and you stand on the line and you would just practice pulling it out of the pouch and spraying it at a target and leave it at that. Is that training? Well yes and no. It is training but it's not the best training that you can you can get for that. So what we do with pepper spray training um, is there's inert cans. It's just basically filled with water and it has a little bit of citrus uh, scent to it and you'll use that to spray an opponent who's coming at you. So 
you get to practice in a 3D environment. Uh, you got an opponent who's coming at you aggressively. Your task is to get your pepper spray out of the pouch and get it up, flip the safety, uh, catch up, depress the plunger, and direct the stream to the person's to the person's face, all under stress, all while you're moving and they're moving, they're trying to get you. And you're feeling the effects of the adrenaline and fight or flight. Your heart rate's up, breathing's up, you know, probably even start, you know, for some people experiencing tunnel vision and stuff like that when you're even doing just the paper spray stuff. And um, in addition to that, um, for pepper spray training, you get contaminated with actual pepper spray at the end and you'll get sprayed and then you got to do some obstacles you'll have to go to a punching bag or, or station and you got to deliver some punches and you go to another station and deliver some knee strikes into a pad uh, and then you'll get a padded baton and you'll strike that baton against this pad several times and then you'll have to uh, you know, pull a little, uh, dummy gun out and, and, and point it at someone. All while you're doing this, you know, you're being coached to, to try and rapidly blink your eyes to cause uh, tearing to make the particulate matter come out so you can actually see. Um, you're doing all this, and then, you know, once you do that, then you gotta usually cuff someone or, or whatever. That type of reality based training. Um, really helps to inoculate a person against uh, all that stress involved in it. So when you take a person who, who, who's taken a, a good pepper spray training course like that and there's an accidental uh, cross-contamination, you know, they sprayed at someone and the wind blew and some of it came back on or more. They sprayed them in the face and it kind of splattered and some of the droplets came back and they start feeling some of the effects of it. Or they spray it in someone's face and it gets in some of their mouth and they spit it back out at them. Um, if that person who has had that training gets that cross-contamination, well, they've already felt that before. They know what to expect and they know how to work through it. Whereas if you've taken, take someone who's never had that kind of training and they get an accidental cross-contamination, they could very well freak out because they've never experienced that before and they've never worked through it and they, they just, they don't know what to do. So reality-based training can get you as close to the real thing as possible and it just allows you to be able to perform better under stress when the when the real thing happens. Um, force on force training, you know, of course it validates the fundamentals that you've learned in firearms training. So, you know, in traditional firearms training, you know, it all starts on the range. Uh, you know, you can do things like uh, malfunction drills. You can take your magazine, throw in some dummy rounds in there, um, and as you're shooting your gun, uh, you know, bang, bang, click. Well, you know, you go through your uh, immediate response to that is to tap rack, uh, get the gun back in the fight. And you learn those things. You learn, of course, you know, stance, grip, front sight focus, trigger control, all that. And then when you get to force on force uh, training, what you've learned on the range comes into play with force on force and it validates what you've learned and if you didn't learn something very well it's going to show so one of the things with uh with these guns and uh training ammo is they are prone to malfunctioning uh every once in a while you know the gun gets a little bit dirty because obviously this is you know not as, as, as clean as, as the you know real gun or whatever and, and, and ammo can be. Sometimes this little capsule can kind of break inside and it'll you know just cause a feeding malfunction or whatever. So some malfunctions are more prone to occur with uh, force and force. And when you get someone in a force and force class and they haven't trained very well on malfunction drills or they haven't really practiced it after they learned it, that really that really shows because they'll be in the fight and you know bang bang click and they're like uh, 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 uh. you see that delay and they just they kind of stare at the gun like staring at it, it's going to fix it um, whereas someone who has been trained well on it and has practiced it you know they go bang 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 click and it's automatic boom get that gun back in the fight as quick as possible um, you'll even see uh, people you know in the very first stages of their force on force training uh, you'll see that uh, for a lot of people, they're not even really focusing on the front sight. They're 
practically point shooting and uh, I can I can attest to that I remember my first couple scenarios I went into um, when I did the uh, the self-assessment afterwards a little worksheet you know record down my uh, uh, my memories and all that and my feelings and, and self you know review whatever I don't really recall seeing the, the sights on the first couple scenarios that I went through um, I had no recollection of seeing the sights at all and in in reality probably what I was doing I, I was point shooting under stress uh, but as you do some more evolutions you'll start to see that front sight and then you'll put that front sight center mass and then you'll start pressing trigger and that's where the force on force um, really helps in those regards is it gets you to um, one you, you become Obviously, like I said earlier, stress inoculated, you're getting yourself calmed down and you're able to really focus on the fundamentals of front sight focus and trigger control and make your hits count. So a lot of people, you know, that first, those first couple scenarios, sometimes the, the role player they're shooting at doesn't have any marks on them and they, they never um, report feeling anything because the person is just basically, you know, ah, da, 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 fire a couple of rounds without... Uh, uh, doing front side focus like they should be. This this equipment allows you to build upon some of the basics and fundamentals that you've learned. So uh, team tactics, for example, uh, you can only do so much with team tactics on the range because it's not a 3D environment on the shooting range. You're limited to rounds just going in one direction. In a lot of places they don't like for people to be in front of other people or forward of other people when on the range. They think that you know let's say for example uh, you know these are these are two people and the targets are down here. If one person is just that far forward there's some people who will They'll shut the range down, you know, they'll call for a ceasefire, and um, that really limits the the um, learning ability for, for team tactics, you know, bounding and, and going to cover and communication and everything. So when you're on that type of range where you have that type of instructor who doesn't allow that to go on, well, there's a, a training block there, a training scar. You don't learn those things. And... Even if you do have the range and the instructor who will allow someone to be a little far forward of you know this person shooting and then this person bounding back and then bounding back, bounding back. Even if you got a range and instructor that will do that, uh, you're still somewhat limited in, in some regards. And this allows you to build upon those basics that you've already learned or allows you to actually learn those basics because obviously there's less risk of someone dying with force on force. Um, so team tactics, uh, cover, uh, utilizing cover very well. Uh, so you know we can we can put a barrel, um, you know, out on the range and and have the student you know hide behind cover, and you know teach them, hey, don't crowd your cover. Um, you know, have some standoff between you and your cover. That way, there's uh, less of you visible to your opponent. Well. When it comes to force on force and you get these little guys flying at you and they kind of hurt when they hit, people start to, to realize that concept, concept very well. And they'll make sure that they have their elbow, their elbow tucked in or they'll make sure that they don't, they don't swing that knee too far out from behind cover or that they, they actually have a standoff from that cover and they present less of them as possible because Pain is a good motivator. Pain is a great teacher. They don't want to feel the pain of this little guy smacking them right in the inner thigh uh, close to their groin when they're kneeling too far out from behind cover and, and exposing more of them than what they should be. Um, and as the stress inoculation um, progresses and they're, they're able to um, have lower heartbeats and lower breathing rates, you know, you can start adding on additional tasks for the students to complete, um, you know, get them to uh, operate a radio, operate a cell phone, 
uh, get out a training tourniquet and apply it to themselves or apply it to someone else. Um, those little tasks, you know, can be added on and they will be more proficient in being able to do other things using the front of their brain more versus just the midbrain uh, being more dominant. That's about it on what I have to say about uh, force on force training and really how important it is. If you are interested in taking force on force training, uh, I'm going to be offering force on force training, obviously. Uh, this training will be offered to regular people. Um, if you got a concealed carry license, even if you don't have a concealed carry license, um, these classes will be available for you to take. Uh, if you've had little to no formal training whatsoever, this still can apply to you and you can still come and take it. There's not going to be any restrictions. Really, the only restriction would be that um, you're not a felon um, that would preclude you from owning a firearm anyway. Um, but other than that, anyone else is going to be able to come take this training regardless of your level of training or no training at all. As I said, you know, there is some pain involved with this, but it's, it's not, it's not bad at all. It's, I don't want that to be the scaring point for some people like, oh my God, this is going to hurt so bad. Um, uh, you know, I've very, I've wore a very, uh, wore a t-shirt doing this training. Yeah, you feel it, but it does not hurt that bad. It doesn't leave, you know, big old nasty bruises or anything like that, that you're going to feel for days afterwards. You feel, you feel them hit, but it's not like you're going to be sore and, and, and marked up all ugly for, you know, days to come. So don't let that be something that deters you from coming and taking it. And don't let your uh, lack of training or your very minimal amount of training be something that scares you away from coming and engaging in this type of training. This is some of the best training uh, that you can get in, in terms of firearms uh, self-defense training. I'll also be doing classes for security and law enforcement and be doing some active shooter type of classes. So if you're a church, school, business that's interested in active shooter training, uh, I'll be offering that. If you're a security company, security just a, you're just a security guard by yourself, uh, classes will, will be catered to that. Uh, police agencies um, who are a little too poor and can't afford this stuff on their own, obviously you know I can offer for that. Um, or even the individual officers who come from agencies that, you know, they may have these, but they just don't have enough budget to do it a whole lot throughout the year. Uh, of course, it's going to be open to you. Like I said, there's not going to be any, uh, any restrictions in place other than you need to be a lawful, um, law-abiding citizen. If you have any questions or comments, go ahead and leave them down in the comments section. Head on over to the Facebook page and do the same over there. Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense. Thank you for watching.